Welcome to the daily Glasgow Cappuccino. Start each day of COP26 by drinking in a few minutes of warm, stimulating conversation about climate resilience. I'm your host, Peter Willis from The Resilience Shift. Shall we begin? My guest on this morning's Cappuccino is the Reverend James Bagwan. James is a minister in the Methodist Church in Fiji and serves as the General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches. He is a passionate advocate for ecological stewardship and climate justice, with a particular focus on care for the ocean, gender justice, and self-determination issues. He's a keen stand-up paddler and a longtime volunteer chaplain and crew member of the Fijian traditional voyaging canoe, Utoniyalo. So welcome to the Cappuccino, James. It's lovely to have you here with us. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure. And thanks for the invitation to um, grab a cappuccino with you. Yes. Well, cheers. <laughs> and, uh, James, I'm interested to, to know how you came to be a climate advocate. I think for, for people in the Pacific, the, the reality is that um, many of us pay attention to what's happening in our world. Um, you know, as someone who grew up uh, and, and developed a strong affinity to the ocean, raised by parents who were particularly my mother, who was quite um, a strong advocate of care for the environment, or as we say from a Christian context, care for creation. So she was always keeping, um, keeping us as a family up to date on key issues when it came to the environment. Uh, you know, we grew up very early understand or learning about the reduce, reuse, recycle, um, you know, and then as, as further R's got, got added, you know, so she was that kind of person. Um, but particularly for, for me, it was really when I started to hear from our churches about the issue of climate change and um, listening to, um, uh, you know, sisters and brothers from the Christian community from um, around the Pacific, sharing their experiences and, and what they were going through and the struggles they were also having to, uh, or facing in, in uh, trying to understand and appreciate uh, what this meant from a theological perspective. But um, really uh, almost 20 years ago now, um, the um, Osintai Declaration by Pacific churches and church leaders. Um, Osintai is the uh, Kiribati word for, for sunrise. And so it was a meeting of Pacific churches, uh, church leaders in Kiribati in 2004, which was the first um, statement by Pacific churches on the issue of, uh, of climate change. And that really was um, a very important um, uh, awareness raising for us as, as members of, uh, of churches in the Pacific. Um, and then, of course, the 2007 IPCC report which really placed it front and center for us and said, okay, this is, um, we have the lived experience of Pacific Islanders uh, from Kiribati, from Tuvalu and from other low-lying atolls in, across our region. And here's the science to confirm in case you didn't care what the, what, what the, the islanders said. And I think that was really the, the, the realization that uh, this is something we really have to pay attention to. Fascinating. Um, so you've had a number of years, it seems, um, working on this question of how do you uh, raise the awareness of those for whom the Pacific Islands are a far distant part of their world. Uh, and uh, you're now in COP. Uh, and I'm interested to know what message you're bringing from the more than 30 churches that uh, you represent on the Pacific Council of Churches. Thank you. Um, yes, the Pacific Conference of Churches has 33 member um, churches, 10 national councils of churches spread across 19 Pacific islands and territories. So from the North Pacific, the South and Southern Pacific, the East and the West. And it covers, um, you know, through the Pacific Ocean, one third of the planet. And so these are some of the most vulnerable communities um, in, in, in the world in terms of the impact of climate change, um, not just rising sea levels, but extreme weather patterns. Um, we're also facing the issue of our ocean being under threat. Um, we're already suffering from the exploitation of the ocean and now 
the impact of climate change is, is, is threatening. Um, an ocean that not only provides uh, sustenance for us, uh, not only is part of our identity as Pacific people, but also does an incredible amount of work for the planet in terms of regulating the, um, the climate through its ocean currents, um, creating more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe um, through the phytoplankton in, 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 the, um, in the sea. And so climate change has been on the Pacific Church's agenda for, for many years. Um, as I said, 2004, the Ocentai Declaration. We had another landmark declaration by Pacific Church leaders in 2009 with the Moana Declaration, which I think for the first time began to engage in the conversation of climate-induced displacement and relocation. Um, and so the mandate from our churches remains strong. We need to see the absolute commitment to the Paris Agreement. We need that as a minimum. We need the climate financing, um, not only in the issue of um, adaptation and mitigation, but also the issue of climate-induced displacement and relocation internally in some of the bigger islands. But if nothing is done, and if this, uh, the, the negotiations and the conversations at COP just remain at that, at rhetoric, um, the very real a possibility of whole nations having to eventually relocate. And um, that's going to take a lot of work by, uh, by, by states. That's going to be take, uh, has a lot of uh, implications on the role of churches, but it's also going to take finance as well. And um, of course, the fear that um, uh, in dealing with all of these issues, that um, as we get the world moving to to a greener uh, technology, to renewable energy, cleaner energy, that that does not come at the expense of the environment, further expense of the environment, and particularly for us in the context of um, care for the ocean. And so, um, you know, these are issues we continue to talk about in, in, in our uh, Pacific churches. We regularly talk about this. And, um, you know, I've come here with that, um, that mandate to raise what we call in from a Christian perspective, the prophetic voice, the, you know, the advocacy um, to support our Pacific uh, states that are going to be there and negotiating. So our pastoral support and also support in solidarity with the many other civil society groups and governments and communities that are going to be at COP pushing for um, you know, for the best that we can get out of um, of COP26. I would imagine, James, that you and your fellow Pacific um, advocates, both government and civil society and so on, must be in a way sort of specialists in what it means to be relatively powerless in a, in a global negotiation like this, um, when you have, by any measure, enormous right on your side and and there's clearly a, an, an injustice quietly being perpetrated over a long period here um and i imagine it must be quite frustrating to come into these great sort of gatherings where the voices of the the powerful in the north tend to um have the microphone what what is your sense of the the potential for shifting this narrative? Well, you know, um, we are pragmatists, if nothing but pragmatists in the Pacific, because we, we have to deal with the reality of the inaction of the world. We have to deal with when rhetoric stays rhetoric and when uh, great announcements are not backed by, by hard decisions and, and, and action. It sometimes takes a lot for us to actually decide to come and participate. Um, you know, there is um, a concern that sometimes we have very high expectations and we go home very disappointed. But um, you know, this is a fight that we we're in it for life, and so we have to be there. We're mindful that there are many people, not just from the Pacific, but from other um affected communities in the global south that cannot be there because of COVID-19 and so those of us who can be there have to be there and we speak then not just on our behalf but we amplify their voices um, and you know the other thing is that of course our our faith we're deeply spiritual people and so from our faith gives us hope 
you know, um, and and um, and the hope that um, you know that there will be uh, at least something closer to the outcome that we we are praying for and that we we are calling for that we are crying for, um, and we also exist as a warning. And and you know, the Fiji Prime Minister recently said, we can no longer be the canary in the go in the coal mine. Um, and that's the reality. Huh? Um, fossil fuel is what's killing this planet, and no one really wants to make the shift. No one that should, should I say, really wants to make that shift. Um, but we exist as a warning. If you don't care about us, just watch what happens to us, and that's going to happen to your people too. Um, you know, on my way to COP, uh, I came a very long way, tried to. Um, uh, keep my carbon emissions down by, you know, having as many meetings uh, in every stop along the way, uh, taking a train, you know, as much as I could. Um, and what I've seen and what I've heard in Europe is the experience of people who are also trying to share with their governments and with a lot of their own population about the impacts of climate change in Europe. The floods recently in Germany, um, the rising sea levels um, in Scandinavia and in Northern Europe, um, you know, the droughts, the floods, these, uh, the extreme winter that will probably happen. This is climate change. And if you don't care about the Pacific, well, Yes, we're sad about that, but this is going to happen to your own country. And so, you know, we are, we are one community. And, and I think that's the, the biggest injustice is when people put profit ahead of, of the planet. And we've got to work on this together. James, I can't thank you enough, um, both for all the work you're doing on behalf of all of us. Um, there in the Pacific. Uh, and I really appreciate your taking time to think out loud with us about these huge dilemmas. And I wish you all possible strength. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Just um, at the end, you know, um, as we are talking about resilience, mm. uh, you know, let, let me say this, the Pacific are resilient people. We, you know, we, we practice our indigenous knowledge and wisdom, and that is what saves us in, in times of, of disaster. And um, this is an important thing, too, that as we move forward, the, you know, while the decisions and changes need to be made, it's also the voice of indigenous communities that will provide the resilience and the shifts uh, that need to be made. So we need to listen to the voice of our indigenous people. And they all say the same thing, walk gently on the earth, glide mm -hmm. gently on the ocean um, and pay attention to what the environment is saying. And this is us you know, not just thinking about the human life, because Pacific Islanders are, uh, you know, intrinsically connected to, to the environment through culture and spirituality and practice. So, you know, we, we learn from the environment, we, we are provided for by the environment, and we need to also care to protect the environment as well. So I just wanted to leave that thought with us as well. I'm so glad you did. Um, beautifully put. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much, James, and all, all the best. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.